explorers! Hello explorers! Hello explorers! I mentioned something about the danger of life at sea, and they are many, naturally. Um, fishing is not a safe profession. Um, in fact, it's reckoned to be second in danger only to coal mining. Um, this story is a story by a, a Guernsey fisherman of an episode during the last World War, uh, when the Channel Islands were occupied by the Germans. It was given to me by Mr. David Gillingham Sr. and uh, very kindly he allowed me to uh, edit it and include it in this book. It's, it was, it's written by Mr. Lloyd Leconte, a Guernsey fisherman, and it's entitled Encounter with a Floating Mine. <clears throat> in 1943, I started to fish under the guidance of Mr. Dan Domile, a very experienced fisherman. During the war it was always difficult to fuel our engines. This work fulfilled an essential function as it provided food for a starving population when it is reported even dogs were eaten. Sixty percent of its catch was commandeered by the occupying forces. On the 8th of June that year, a friend bought me a can of petrol. The Germans used to employ him as a lorry driver and often he would siphon off petrol from the tank and sell it to fishermen. I paid him one German mark. Consequently, the next day, Wednesday the 9th of June, we were able to go off to sea on board our fishing boat, Marina, registration number GU56. It was a fine sunny morning, no wind, a flat calm. We went to haul four of our pots set in 30 fathom of water about a mile and a half northeast of Enfroc. This was a, a sunken reef uh, north, northeast of Guernsey. It was low tide and there was no current. We had just started to haul our pots when suddenly a hole appeared in the surface of the water. It was a whirlpool with a diameter of 200 metres. Our pots were dragged to the bottom. It was decided damn quick to abandon our pots and we left to look, to look for others that we had laid around the Furki next, to, next door to Jetu, another offshore island. This is the only time I have witnessed such a phenomenon in our local waters and I can never recall any report of a similar event. Marina was a small six and a half metre vessel with only a six horsepower engine, so the passage took two hours. Luckily we had enough petrol. Once arrived at our destination we set to work when suddenly we heard a huge explosion. Looking in the direction of the explosion, I saw a tall column of water, 30 metres high, and in it there was the mast of a boat. I told Mr. DeMille straight away what I had seen. He said that no one could possibly have survived such an explosion, but he remarked that just previously he had seen the Kinney brothers' boat in the vicinity, so we motored towards the site of the catastrophe. I stood in the bows of the marina, keeping a lookout for survivors, if there were any. As we drew near the site of the explosion, the boat was surrounded by hundreds of bits of wood and debris from the fishing boat. Suddenly, I spotted, I spotted a, an arm sticking out of the water, and shortly afterwards, two men in the water, these were Jack and Harry Kinney, served, uh, saved by a miracle. We pulled them straight away on board. But their two crewmen, Mr. Dunn and Mr. Sabir, had disappeared and were never found. 
Jack later explained what had happened. They had noticed some nets drifting on the surface. At that time, when all gear was scarce, this was too precious a find to be lost. They began to haul them on board, but at the last moment they noticed the mine entangled in the nets. Too late. The rest was darkness. Barely ten minutes later, a dense fog closed in. Visibility was reduced to seven metres. The survival of the Kinney brothers depended on three coincidences. Without the, petrol, the, the stolen petrol, without the appearance of the whirlpool, and without the continuance of good visibility, they would have perished. We set course for the harbour at St Sampson's where the ambulance was summoned because Harry had received injuries to his leg. For the rest of his life he suffered from nightmares about this disaster. A bit like post-traumatic stress. The Germans arrested all of us to, to interrogate us about the two missing men. They suspected that the pair had escaped to England in the Sunrise, the Kinney's boat, registration GU111. We, for, we, for, we were forbidden going out to sea for two days. Press in, the press in Guernsey launched a public appeal for funds to help the dependents of Mr Dunn and Mr Sabir. The appeal brought in £300 within a fortnight. That was a hell, of a, lot of, a hell of a lot of money at that time. In fact, it was remarkable in those difficult times and a witness to the solidarity of the Guernsey people.